Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by Pacific Calls. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world famous Andy Shaver. They will be at both Squad Fest and Delta this weekend. So come buy your calls. Yep. And check out Lucky Duck. They got a brand new product line coming out. And that's luckyduckpremiumdecoys.com. Check them out. All right. With us today from Nashville, Tennessee. Actually, you're in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, aren't you? Could. No, I'm actually in Nashville. We haven't flew up there okay. yet. Okay. He's. Problem with the plane. He's in Nashville. Boy, that's me all the time. Getting on a fucking plane's always a deal. Always a problem with the plane. Mr. Austin Moody, who's got a big hit out right now, says, I'm just saying. And by God, I'm just saying is exactly right because your song says exactly how we all feel. I don't give a shit if you're a guy and you want to dress like a girl, but don't show that shit to my kids. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> Man, I'm, uh, you know, super happy that it's it's gone over so well and, uh, you know, I, I felt, I mean, just being here in Nashville for 15 years, and I mean, it's, it's a big old blue dot or a little blue dot in a, in a red state. And so, uh, definitely, uh, knew I'd be putting on a you know, target on my back here in town and it's going, well, I'm going to do this. You know, I want to say something. And again, I just, I've got a 15 month old daughter. So uh, what's going on right now? It's, it's not worth me being politically correct and not saying something, you know? So, I mean, hopefully people hear this song and, you know, give us a little bit of encouragement to, to feel okay to disagree with this shit. So, so in, in the actual inner circle of Nashville, is there that many fucking bleeding heart fucking liberals in Nashville that are in the music industry? <laughs> well, <clears throat> There, there's a lot of there's a lot of patriots, but they can't say anything. I mean, as far as the guys running, you know, pushing the buttons and calling the shots, and you know, the the executives, uh, you know, they're all you know they want Nashville to be L.A. and New York and Atlanta and and you know bring all their ideals with them. So I mean. Here we've got CMT, you know, that just pulled the stunt with Jason's thing. And then, uh, you know, a couple of months ago on CMT Awards, they had a drag parade. I mean, we're talking country music right. here. There's there. These people have no idea what a country music fan is anymore. And the consumer and the country music fan that's listening to the radio, when you give them a choice between white bread and white bread, what do you, what, what do you think they're going to pick? The white bread. They don't have any other options, you know, because they control the whole situation. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, to answer your question, that's a huge problem here in town. I mean, it's, you know, we know they've got pop and rock and all the other genres, but they own country music, too. Hopefully we can work on changing that. You know, this Aldine thing I think was a big, a big deal to work in that direction. And I've been hearing some rumors about other guys pulling their videos or you know business ventures with CMT in a big way. So I don't know. We might see a little bit of change. Now, isn't part of the problem who owns CMT? And I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But I, is it Paramount? Does Paramount <laughs> own CMT? You know, is it Gaylord Entertainment? That's no, a, um, I'm gonna look it up real quick. Who owns CMT? It, yeah, I'm, I'm um, yeah, yeah. They're they're part of uh, Paramount Media Networks, so like that's their whole thing. Like if you look, Paramount also has yeah, yeah Viacom, CBS, Merge. So it's a CBS deal. My wife <clears> is not a big boycotter of stuff. She boycotted Target. Six months ago, and by God, our Target card has a zero balance and has stayed there because she hasn't bought shit for six months, hasn't been in Target, and I'm proud of her for that. She also, in the morning, 
watches CMT because she watches Roseanne, the old Roseannes, and she loves them. Gotta love Roseanne. And she watches Mom late at night on CMT. Our TV hasn't been on CMT in a week now, and it won't ever be again. So it's just one person, but it don't take very many hundred thousand of those one people to quit that shit, and these companies will start losing their ass. Well, this tells you everything. They own uh, Comedy Central, uh, Flix, never, MTV, Nickelodeon, CMT. So, I mean, that you're, they're already pushing that stuff, a lot of that stuff on Nickelodeon and to the kids. So, um, oh yeah, I was I was glad to see Jason Aldean's come out and he stood up, and I saw where I'm not a Luke Bryan fan. I don't need to catch that shit from everybody that listens to this podcast. But Luke Bryan come out and said, "Why aren't that, you a Luke Bryan fan?" Well, because it's not real popular to be a Luke Bryan oh, fan. Oh, <laughs> okay. I don't actually. I don't listen to. I don't listen to Luke Bryan anyways. But I'm glad to see that John Rich, big conservative, I like to see that shit. But sell like, like fucking liberal ass fucking Garth Brooks and fat ass Trish Yearwood. Fuck them. We don't need that shit no more anyways. I'm telling you, on behalf of the American people that listen to country music, fuck Garth Brooks. Hmm. And I'm not the only person well, that feels I'll, that way. I'm telling you right now. You walk down that street in Nashville with all the bachelorette parties and shit, and them women ain't fucking cooing over no fucking Garth Brooks. But you can't diminish what he did in country music. When he first started, he was great. Well, even oh, He's a fucking sellout. Um, Garth's first album is his best album. His second album is probably away. great. Jeff, we were just listening to Much Too Young. No, you were you listening were head to bobbing. it. He had his fist in the air. We were listening Shit. to Much Too not. Young. That was a great. That was a great <laughs> that song. White line's getting longer, Jeff. That I wonder was a, what white line he's talking about. Yeah, snorting cocaine off his wife's well, fat ass. Jeff, you love that song, and that's okay to love that song. Nope. You don't have to agree with his politics for him to have a good song. He hadn't had a good song in thirty years. That's okay. Has David Allen Coe? You still like him? Don't talk about David Allen oh, Coe. Okay, in that now way. it's a different story. Austin. David Allen Coe's great. Now it's a different story. What? <laughs> We don't have country well, singers like we used to. <laughs> Charlie Daniels was a patriotic, red-blooded American. He dies. And what do we fucking get? We got replaced by somebody like Garth Brooks. Not even close. We need more American. Country music is built on guys in pickup trucks, working combines. The working person listens to country music. And I'm going to tell you right now, the hottest chicks listen to country music too. You go to Nashville, Tennessee, and you walk up and down the deal. It's best-looking women in the world in them bachelorette parties. Do you agree, Andy? Uh, I mean, Vegas would be a tough Oh, uh, fuck no. No. Really? Vegas got some good-looking women. I think Nashville, ten- Nashville's the bachelorette capital of the world, isn't it? Unfortunately. <laughs> they bring a lot of business to town, though, don't they? Oh, shit, yeah, man. It, it, they, uh... It's, you know, all the pedal ta- taverns, and, I mean, if I had had the idea of creating a hayride when I first moved to town, I'd be a multi multi millionaire right now. A hayride? So, yeah. I mean, tractors and hayrides. That's what they do on these bachelorette parties. It's, dude, it's, uh, almost embarrassing <laughs> to go downtown. <laughs> you didn't notice that when we were there. I didn't see hayrides. I no. didn't see hayride, but you saw them on the little pedal pedal monsters where them girls are yeah, all pedaling and that's shit. That's the trend I can't wrap my head around. They're gonna go to a, a bar that they got to pedal their fucking fat ass feet on for however long they're on that thing, or the or the. I, I'm assuming it doesn't go. And you got to bring your own. Booze. Oh, you have to bring your own booze for that. That's a great. Yeah, but- that's a great business model. <laughs> no way. I thought there was a bartender. There is, but see, they got in trouble where it was like, uh, you know, a moving vehicle or whatever. So now it's like BYOB or whatever. Oh, I didn't know. That makes sense. I did not know this. But them damn things are, I mean, they've got them things lined up going all the time. So, I mean, no gas. You got to pay one person on there. You bring your own booze and whatever, 15 people's paying to pedal around the ash. Like 50 bucks a pop. (laughs) <laughs> that's smart damn business that's like owning a titty bar and the girls pay you to dance if you put that on shark tank mark cuban would laugh at you like here's what here's my plan we're gonna have this transportation system people are gonna come from all over they're gonna pay me they're gonna bring their own booze and they're gonna pedal for hours in the country boy can't survive in the nashville swamp there's another great american is bo cephas that's yep right. he left i saw where he resigned from cmt's board after all this shit because he stood with jason well, I mean, was they playing much Bo Cephas? No, I don't listen. I don't watch CMT. They, when I when CMT first came out, it was country. It was the MTV for yeah. country music. Now it's fucking it TV great. shows and shit. 
I mean, it's that. Yeah, I mean, that's it. even I mean, 20, it hadn't been good for twenty years. No, nobody gives two shits about CMT anymore, anyways. But I'm glad to see he got off of there. I want to see somebody like a great Texan George Strait come out and say something. Yeah. I don't want George Strait to be liberal. Why, want, would, why would he ruin his brand? It ain't ruining his brand. It's making your brand stronger. Yeah. Jason why Aldean. Take the, why take the chance? Who cares? Have some balls. George Strait. Tacti- he's tactical. Oh, fuck. Andy don't like George Strait anyway, so. He's tactical. I didn't say I don't like him. You have many times on this podcast, you've trashed George Strait. He's the greatest. Never. Anyways, awesome. the king, if he would come out and say, hey, I stand with Jason. I'm sick of this woke shit. His popularity is just going to grow because 90% of the people that go see you guys in concert think just like we do. That's the bottom line to the whole deal. I don't give a shit what color you are. They always want to make it sound like this is a racial deal. It's not a racial deal. Black people are sick of this shit also. They've had it. Oh, yeah. I mean, fuck. The people have had enough of this shit. And I'm glad to say your song was right. Portland is a shithole. Fucking Chicago is. People are leaving New York and L.A. like crazy because they want to get their family and their kids away from that shit. And unfortunately, and then they're coming here and then bringing their ideals with them. It's like, they love it here so much. I mean, Nashville, everybody's coming here, man. And you know, it's like after they get here, they're wanting to change into the same shit. You know, they're the ones that's saying whatever's racist and this and that, let's take down another statue. And I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. I mean, we're just, we're really not a serious nation anymore. No, it's uh, no, we're not. We got guys like Brad Paisley up there carrying the torch for us. He's another liberal little fucker. You just gonna bash every every ma- major <laughs> country music artist today? I'm not gonna say nothing bad about Alan Jackson. Like just I like Alan Jackson. Pick somebody. I mean, my goodness. Okay. I'm gonna ask you a question. You played on on Broadway, I guess, for a long time before you got a break. Is that true? Uh no. So when I first moved to town, um, I moved in, well, shortly after I moved to town, moved in to a townhouse right beside of a hit songwriter. His name was D. Vincent Williams. And um, I was getting to the point where, you know, I was wanting to go out and start playing clubs and working on my chops. And he told me, he said, you want to be seen, but not too much. He said, the worst thing you could do right now is go down and play Broadway because, uh, They'll, they'll disrespect you. I mean, they, they won't respect you. Um, and so what I did was I went up to, um, I lived here in Nashville and for two years, for years, I would, uh, go up to Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg, Knoxville for like four days a week and play, uh, you know, four hours a night, two acoustic sets, two full band sets of a week. And so that's where I really owned my chops and I would, you know, just commute to Nashville, uh, up there and so really i was able to suck and it not matter (laughs) you know (laughs) so that's that that was you know a really good piece of advice um it's not like i mean i moved here 15 years ago but if it was 30 years ago yeah you would go down you would get a gig at tootsies or the fiddle and steel and the stage and you know that's when there were great musicians on broadway playing um the artist everybody didn't sound the same they had their own thing labels would still go in and you know spot talent you know rascal flats was discovered in the fiddle and steel joe nichols fiddle and steel um there's a lot of those stories but that came to an end um i think probably about 20 years ago and when nashville started to become the place you know everybody's got a bar whatever go down there right now it's all the same shit unfortunately um and two the bars down there they don't want to pay those guys anything or the musicians so the lowest bidder gets the gig if you're willing to play for free you get the gig so your level of talent goes way down I, I didn't <laughs> that's what that. that's what i was told we, we we spent two different times in nashville this year and knoxville and knoxville both and but in nashville a guy we were at uh blake shelton's bar and there was a kid on stage that was pretty good name. Uh, I'll think of his name in a minute. I'm sure you know him, but he plays there, I guess, pretty regular. And he's a, and he does that. And a guy told me, he said, he'll never make it. I said, why? He said, he's, you can't make it up here no more. And he told me basically the same thing. He said, the chances of you getting off of Broadway and having a record contract are pretty slim these days. And 
Yeah, it really is. I mean, <clears throat> first thing they're going to do is go, well, what's your, what's your TikTok numbers, you know? But, but also there's just a little bit of inside information. You know, when people can go down and see your ass play Dixieland Delight five nights a week, they're just not going to respect that. You know, and it's going to be really hard to um, not be seen as that guy. You got to have a thing. There's got to be this mystique. And, you know, that quote from my from my buddy, you know, you won't be seen, but not too much. And you definitely don't want to be seen when you haven't, you know, when you're not ready. And that first impression is everything. You'll never get it back. So <clears throat> I feel like I'm I'm just now starting to be seen. <laughs> I've been here 15 yeah, years. Yeah, you know, they say it takes so. like 10 years of really, really hard work to become an overnight success. So, That's right. You know, there's a lot of truth to that. And then you just put out, a, you put out a conservative song and there you go. <laughs> so what led to the shift of, hey, this is the blueprint of making it in Nashville is playing in Nashville to whenever you got there 15 years ago. It's like, no, 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 no. That's the worst thing that you can do. What happened? You mean like I I w I fell into guys that really gave me great advice. I mean, I, I didn't know shit when I moved here. All, only thing I knew how to do was play banjo and milk goats. <laughs> so, you know, it was just I was so green and was lucky enough to to have great people around me that noticed something, but knew I was a long way off from being whatever it was I was going to become. So <clears throat> the shift happened when, again, you've got guys down there and bars are paying you, paying musicians 50 bucks a night for four hours. And you got guys working, you know, two, du you know, a double shift or a triple mm -hmm. shift. That's eight hours, 12 hours. And they're walking away with a couple hundred bucks. I mean, People that came and feel their fingers playing guitar so long at the end of the night, you know, and they go to put them in ice and they're not getting paid shit. So, you know, they get to a point where guys that are great, they're not going to do that. And then as Nashville became more popular and more popular, there's a, there is a very strict set of rules now that come from the clubs of what you're going to play. Uh, and a, even a set list of when you're going to play it. So it, it's all about selling alcohol for them. It has nothing to do with <clears throat> show cat case and talent. Really the only places I go down there every now and then and the spot with the best talent, believe it or not, is kid rocks. Really? In my opinion. Um, yeah, he's, you know, it's just, I think he's the second owner or whatever is uh, the same guy that owns Tootsie's and Honky Tonk Central. But Kid Rocks, man, um, every time I go down there, I'm blown away. I'm like, these these guys could be stadium acts. So, uh, but pretty much everywhere else is the same right. shit. So 20, 30 years you ago, know. Nashville had this underground theme to it where – you know, that you could become the next rascal flat if you just play it right. And now it's almost like it's just a sideshow. Yes, absolutely. Rec I mean, record labels, I was told, um, won't mention his name, but guy that pretty much runs one of the biggest labels in town, they, they had just signed a girl um, who they had never met in person solely based on uh she hit a certain algorithm on tiktok she was singing a cover song in her apartment and has never played a live show and every label in town was fighting for her. they signed her to a million dollar record deal never met her just did a meeting over zoom or skype or whatever so that's they they have these systems set in place to where when an algorithm or a, an artist or whatever, a video, a song spikes anywhere in the world, like that company will notify them, then they will contact that person and sign them to a, a deal or a one song deal or, or whatever else. So that's how a lot of this stuff is happening. And you see 
you know, the talent level um, and the quality and music and uh, in general, just kind of going downhill. What's interesting to me, this is something that I've seen on TikTok is somebody will have like a hook or a chorus that's really, really good and a little bit of music to it. And then they're like, we're still working on the rest of it. And it's, but, it, but it's getting like millions of views. And I've got one guy in particular that I'm thinking of. I'm not going to mention his name here because. Why? You're not in the music industry? Yeah, but I, I don't want to offend the guy. But he did recently have a bad outing. Uh, and that also went viral. And uh, I'll tell you who he is off air. Maybe you know him, maybe you don't. But for a long time, all you saw on TikTok was videos to the chorus. And that gained steam, and then it's like a year later, we're going to have this song out finally. And then he did have a bad night uh, a couple months ago. But, you know, I mean, like you said, though, this was somebody that was probably never played a live show, probably never played in front of anybody, didn't have uh, the longevity, because I'm assuming that, you know, your vocal cords are like any other muscle, and doing it occasionally is not going to it's not going to lead to a long life on the road. Like you got to have those bad boys conditioned and oiled up if you're going to do this multiple nights a week. So we He's, just fell into that pitfall. I saw a kid when I was in Nashville and I looked him up now and you may know him and you may not. Connor Sweet. Do you know him? I don't. See, and that's what I mean. It's it, you'd think it would be a small circle there, but it's not. But he play he was playing in uh in uh Blake's place one night when we were there. And I, so I, I took, he was pretty good. He played all of somebody else's music. I don't know if he ever plays any of his own music, but I guess he works every different bar over there and they got buckets when they got the, you can put your cash app or your Venmo on there and you can take a picture of it. What kind of money them guys making out? Do you know? If you're one of those guys that's playing like Blake's and there's, there's a few hot spots down there. I mean, there's a, there's a, huge gap between the circle of Broadway guys and the circle of music row guys. Um, they're two completely different things. So, uh, you know, I, I hear stuff based off, you know, musicians I'll hire and stuff that work Broadway and they're, you know, off season and kind of tell me what's going on down there. But some of those guys now, I mean, if you're, if you're playing the right set, if you're working the right clubs um, or working, you know, the right night on at Kid Rocks or Tootsie's, you know, each guy, you know, could walk out of there with seven, eight hundred bucks. But it's got to be the right night, the right set, because um, <clears throat> you'll get idiots down there that go, hey, you know, I'll, I'll pay you a hundred dollars to play Rocky Top. And then somebody will go uh, and then you go, you know. The, the the artist will go well, you know. You can pay us two hundred to stop it. And then somebody will pay two hundred <laughs> to stop it, and then the, and then the guy will pay three hundred to start it again. And you have pe- like wars going on down there like that. Uh, the drunker they are, the more money <laughs> they spend. Awesome. <laughs> People in Nashville get awful rude too about eleven thirty because we did a we're doing a TV yeah. show and we were down there. And we did street interviews and it went really good till about eleven thirty when all the drunks got out of the bars. People got a little rude. There was like, there was a visual shift. And like, we were, of course, asking like political type questions. And like, do you think Garth Brooks a fucking sellout? Things like that. He didn't ask that. But um, like, everybody was kind of happy and like, you know, they're, they're euphoric. And then about 11 30, 11 45, the crowd turned nasty and they were fucking ugly. And we wrapped her up pretty quick. Yeah, it's. <sighs> Dude, I, I don't even recognize that place down there anymore. So there comes a certain point you definitely don't want to be down there. Like, it's like uh, Green Hall, and do you, are you familiar with Green Hall outside of San Antonio and Austin? It's oldest oldest yeah. dance hall in Texas. You mm-hmm. go there, and George Strait played there not long ago. Uh, I think uh, they they have a lot of big stars will go there and just sing. Blake Shelton, I think, was there not long ago. They just impromptu. Do any of the big stars ever play on Broadway at all, or is it just never going to happen? Um, I'm going to say it doesn't happen a lot unless it's like, you know, somebody's do, got their own bar now, you know. So, you know, Blake might do a, something special at Old Red or whatever, but it's you know, Dirk Bentley. I, I've seen where he goes down there at his place and will jump up on the stage, but. Uh, it doesn't happen, I don't think, as much as it used to. 
you know. And the so. and the bars will give you a set list. Like these are the songs you have to play while you're here. So the big ones, Tootsie's, yeah. Kid Rock is another one. I mean, they know they. I mean, if you you've heard of uh, what's the big uh, dance hall in Dallas? Uh, Billy Bob's. Bob's. Is it like no, not the the other one? Uh, River, Red, Red River or something. They can fit like seventy five hundred people on the dance floor. One's in San Antonio. One's in Dallas. Uh, shit, I can't remember. Anyway, they have an actual tracked out map of like what songs provoke people to buy more alcohol what will make them drink so um it goes down to the uh the bpm you know how fast the song goes they have it it's extremely calculated now if you're playing during the day or you know at a you know robert's western world that's they don't have anything like that but the big boys you know that that are churning the the juice. Uh, they definitely they actually have a boot camp. That's what I heard. Wow. The guys playing Kid Rocks now go through like a you know multiple month boot camp off site uh, to uh, learn how to do it. <laughs> Is it Cowboys Red River in Dallas? Is that what it was? Mm-hmm. That's it. That's it. Cowboys. Cowboys yeah. has been around a long, long, long time. Never been. There. If it was the, well, the original Cowboys was there when I was in college, so that had been in the eighties, early nineties. Yeah, they've been. They, I mean, that guy, he was probably one of the pioneers of that whole thing. I've met him once. Uh, the guy that owns them all, and he's a he's a pretty cool dude. He's like the cowboy godfather. I tell you, the greatest free concert ever. In 1980, probably 1990, Van Halen played at the, uh, at uh, West End in Dallas. They had done a concert and something had happened. Power went off or something, so it was kind of a fucked up deal. So they just did an impromptu, and they went and set up. Well, a fucking rumor leaked out. There's 50,000 people down there to see Van Halen when <laughs> Sammy was there, and they put on a hell of a fucking concert. Wow. So is there That's the is there any room for like original type music? Like if you're a, a singer songwriter, like Chris Stapleton or whatever, like is there any room for you to do one of your own songs? If you're playing for like uh, uh, Tootsie's or anything, not on Broadway. No, nope. nope, not happening. Nope, not happening. Damn it! I mean, they've got the Bluebird and the Listening Room and songwriter venues and. And everything but uh no there's there's not any original music being played down there what is the best yeah. way for someone up and coming a young singer say 20 year old kid to get to, to get a breakthrough go on the voice well i mean if i don't there's nothing wrong with trying to go on the voice uh you know it can it it can definitely help you. I mean, I've never done it. I've had a lot of people that go, why don't you go on the voice? And it, it just never been anything that inter- interested me to do that. Um, man, I mean, for somebody young, first of all, they've got to understand that, you know, this is still a, you know, a 10 year plus city town. Um, if I was, if I was just moving to town today, First off, I don't even know how I could afford to live here. If right. I was just graduating high school, I mean, what people's having to pay in rent, I'm going, how in the hell do you even move here with a guitar and a dream and, you know, wait tables and afford rent and then be able to have time to you know, practice or hone your craft that you moved here for? It's so expensive to live in Nashville now. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, a big part of this is, social media uh if you can if you could work up a cover set if you could you know get a few songs done whatever get out start playing uh you know start go back to your hometown you know everybody's if you move to nashville i guarantee you you can go back to your hometown and you know you're you're gonna be somebody because now you moved to nashville so start, you know, getting those peeps on your side. I mean, my hometown was super supportive. And when I go back and play, it's everybody shows up and, and, uh, 
you know, they'll, they'll have your back. So, you know, again, I wouldn't know where to start. You know, I just, I just wanted, knew I wanted to play live. I love being an entertainer and um, start playing the clubs, got on the college circuit, uh, in and out of a few publishing deals, record deals. And then 2020 uh, came along and, you know, everybody lost their gigs. So I feel like it's just now starting to come back with the touring and all that. So it's, it's taken a long time. It really, I mean, it hit everybody, but the independent guys, you know, especially that were, uh, you know, considered openers or whatever. I mean, this, this dramatically affected the venues as well. So, you know, it's taken them a long time to get in a position to be able to pay what they were paying. And so what, what kind of speaking of paid, you got the number six song on iTunes right now. Five now. Five. Okay. I'm going to ask a personal question here. It's financial. But back in the day, my dad knew a little bit about the music industry years and years ago. And he used to talk about if you wrote a hit song, you could retire off of one big hit song. A buddy of his is on a song that George Harrison put on his album after the Beatles. So he got paid a royalty forever every time that album sold. What kind of money does iTunes pay for a song? Number five, it's got to be how many how many downloads have you had of that song? I have no idea because uh, these reports come out like quarterly. So, I, you know, I've never had a song, you know, in the top, even the top 10, top 50. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know what it's going to pay, but I will say this, uh, you know, it might be enough to where we can have the, have the party down at Arby's or something. <laughs> but, so you're not expecting to get a million dollar check? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and and y'all can't splurge and get a cherry turnover or anything. <laughs> you used to with a <laughs> yeah, this is for entrees only. But, but, think about but back in the day, if you had a hit song that was on the radio all the time, you got paid pretty good commission, right? A royalty. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So even even if you let's say you were just a songwriter, and let's just go back to the early two thousands. A number one song, the publishing, not we're not talking about what the artist that put it out made, which is considered the master. So then that's record sales. The publishing royalties on a song that was number one, you know, early 2000s was paying 600000 a quarter, just the publishing royalties. So Dean Dillon made a shitload of money writing music for George Strait. Oh, I mean, absolutely. He's... It's untelling how much, you know. So if you had if you had a couple of hits, you were set. You know, the problem is is a lot of guys that were having hits, um, they were spending it like they were gonna continue having hits and they were gonna pay, you know, they were gonna it was still gonna pay out like it used to. I know a guy who had a number one song on an artist and he had a publishing deal and everything, but probably had a, a split with his publisher. But the thing got 80 million streams on Spotify, uh, and he got a check in the mail for 3,500 bucks. And that was it. Damn. Yeah, I mean, he probably got fo- follow ups, but I mean, we're talking the streaming. The whole streaming thing has damn near ruined the songwriting business as far as country here here in town. Uh, so like what I did with my song, I didn't, I didn't write, I'm just saying, uh, when Barble and Mike Laddermilk wrote it and I, I just asked when, and if he would let me cut it and I'll split the master with him. So the master would be my cut, um, which is a, you know, 50 million streams on Spotify roughly would pay $200,000 to the master. And then the publishing on that, I don't know if it'd be two grand. So, uh, say if this song got 50 million streams, well, we'd split 200 grand. And I just think that's fair. Like at some level, artists are going to have to start splitting their, their portion because it's way bigger. And, you know, again, this is, this is a songwriting town. And the reason, you know, country music was so great has always been so great until a few years back. There was the songwriter like Dean Dillon, and then there was George Strait. 
George Strait would not be George Strait without Dean Dillon, and Dean Dillon wouldn't be Dean Dillon without George Strait. So George literally only wrote one, was a co-writer on one of his number ones, and that was Good Time. Um, but the, it was the yin and the yang. You got the guys that can, can write them, that cannot sing them, and then you got the guys that can sing the hell out of them, and they'll, uh, you know, but, but they're not a great writer. Now, the labels are wanting you to do everything. They're wanting the artist to be on every song. They've got to write every song. And, you know, because the labels want a percentage of everything because there's not enough, you know, to go around as far as just record sales anymore. Even record sales don't make what they used to. So used to, you would you would tour to sell records. Now you're making records to tour. Right. Like Dean Dillon, he wrote Tennessee Whiskey. He made more money probably off David Allen co cutting that because of the way the things were then compared to now with Chris Stapleton then. Well, I don't know if that would be the case because, I mean, Stapleton, I mean, that song is so massive right now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure it'd be interesting to find out though. Because different dynamics then, because when David Allen co cut it, it was the old way record sales and right. plays on the radio. What? So, so he double dipped on the same song. It, it like he, he sold it. He got money off of David Allen co. And then third, however fucking many years later, he gets another check. Just like the, Tracy Chapman does with fast cars from the Chris Staple. Yeah. But she, she recorded fast. Cars she wrote first. it. I understand that Dean Dillon did not perform. No, I mean, Tracy Chapman, her check she got as a writer when she did it originally is probably more than Luke Combs's is because she was the writer and they paid different 30 years ago than they do today. But that's what I'm saying. Dean Dillon got paid twice for Tennessee Whiskey. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's... So he's, you know, it's still, it's just mailbox money. So, I mean, you can have a song that's cut. I mean, there's been writers that's, you know, had songs cut by 10 different artists. You know, and so you're going to get paid the publishing on all those guys each time. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah, I don't see. I, I don't understand the finances of the music stuff. I don't but, either. Because when you watch MTV Cribs or some of that shit, you see these rappers have no idea who they are, but they're buying half million dollar chains and shit. And I'm thinking, how the fuck can they afford this? But that shit? goes back to what he said. It's from these touring. guys lived like they were going to keep pumping that shit out, and they quit doing it. Well, who's the dude that threw all the fucking money in the water? He's some rapper, and he threw like a million dollars, hundred thousand oh, dollars. in Kodak the Black. Yeah, I don't know who the fuck Kodak Black is, but I need to be doing what Kodak Black's doing. Do it. Well, I'll tell you the 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 rap. I don't know much about the rap industry and hip hop, but those guys, the guys running that show, whoever they are, I know they're smart as hell business wise. Those are businessmen, you know, Ice Cube and all the people that you know got that whole thing going they're wicked business dr guys. dre yeah yeah dr dre i mean it's uh incredible what, what but they i did. see these young rappers you know? driving these half million dollar cars and these big gold change and shit and i'm thinking it must be a lot of fucking money in rap music it must be we shouldn't start a podcast we should start rapping i could have done it you, you hindered me. Yeah, I kept you from being a rap star. But so it's money, it's crazy. I, as we talk about rap, I want to talk about this too. Rap music, I'm against censorship. Example, the song, what was it? Kill the Cops? What was the song? Fuck the Police. Fuck the Police by NWA yeah. back years ago. I didn't listen to that stuff. Your brother did. Tony did, yeah. But I listened to Two Live Crew. You, li you listen to NWA. I probably some of their stuff. I like I like Snoop Dogg. I like, but my point is, is if I don't want to listen to it, I can just turn the shit off. When they censor you and Jason's songs about the truth, it pisses me off. Y'all should have the same right those people have. WAP by Cardi B, right? That's who sang that shit. Don't know nothing about the lady at all. They invited her to the White House. To me, her song was fucking disgusting for little girls to listen to. But by God, they'll all play it and they don't censor them. That's my problem I have with all this shit. Is they censor you guys. For speaking the truth, I'm tired of being a tax-paying middle American. I don't pay as much taxes as I should probably, but it pisses me off because we're the ones paying the bills for this country, but we're the ones told everything we do is wrong, and then the scourge of our fucking society get by with shit, and that pisses me off. I'm sick of censorship. Well, you know, 
again, I mean, we're, we're talking about a very minute uh, percentage of the, I mean, the media, all the media has to do is, is say something. I mean, it's just like coming out and going, oh, this is racist. All they got to do is say something. You know, there's only everybody but probably one, you know, Newsmax is ran by the same people, you know. Uh, I'm throwing Fox in there too. And it's, <laughs> oh, they're right. You're right. You know, yeah. And and so, and so it's like when you start calling out lawlessness in the country, it, you know, they want to change the subject. So they just say it's racist. You're racist. And um, then everybody starts picking up on that shit. You know, it's one of those things that when they do that, though, you just saw it with Jason. Uh, it helps us out. You know, it's it just drove it right up there to number one, and it's going to stay there because I mean, look what happened to Morgan Wallen. Yeah, you know that that whole incident, uh, pretty much put him on a worldwide map instead of a small country music map. And you know what he did wasn't great, but it wasn't it was taken way out of context, and the country music fans uh, realized that and. They were like, you know what? I've never heard of this guy, but I'm going to support him because that's bullshit. You know? So. Yeah. Well, there's a counterculture a little bit going on now. Like, it's almost whenever the media says left, you automatically say right or up or down or whatever. Like, anything, it's gotten where anything the media has its hand in, people are sticking their middle finger up in the air to it. Yeah. It, well, when you, when you lie in this country now, you're celebrated. And when you tell the truth, you're persecuted. Right. And they they want to change the subject, and um, I think law and order is something that both sides can agree on. But the people running the show want to kill bipartisanship, and they you know they don't they they want to create the tension. They're shaking the jar, you know. Um, it's it's just like you know you've probably seen that thing where it's like if you put red ants and black ants in the same jar they'll be fine when you shake the jar they'll start killing yeah, each other fight to the and they, they constantly shake the jar um i mean there's i think there's a big old huge gap right down the middle of republican democrat uh <clears throat> extremes on both sides but the but the 90 percent there in the middle between all of them look at this transgender movement and all this crap that's coming out uh and go, this is crazy. They And then they go back to their job and they continue to work and make a living and keep their head down and not say anything. Um, but hey, at the end of the day, all the minorities in the, in the history of, you know, the world, they ended up winning because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Right. Look at the Nazis. You know, everybody's like, oh, you know, that's a conspiracy theorist. You can go watch the documentary of the Hungarian Jews. They said, well, why didn't you, uh, why didn't you all flee? And he said, well, some of us did because, you know, but we call those people conspiracy theorists. And, you know, and it, it was a sl very slow build. It didn't happen overnight. And so when they had to start wearing cross, you know, the star around their neck and putting in front of their businesses, it was too late. And, you know, so <clears throat> again, I mean, this is a, this is not even a, this is more than a political situation at this point. This is an extreme, powerful darkness that's coming over this country. And, and we're, we're not in just a political battle here anymore. It's a spiritual battle. And so, uh, I mean, I may sound crazy, but no, I agree. You know, it, I mean, anytime, anytime that one side of the, whoever, whoever it is left or right, if there's ever a, a topic where they just throw out blanket statements as a method of not engaging in debate and dialogue. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's what just like, right. Well, that's racist. And it's like, we don't talk about it rather than like, no, like, let's just, let's figure this out. What's the problem here? It's just, or that's transphobic. You can't, you can't be against that. You're transphobic. It's like, well, no, I just don't want my four-year-old to see this on Nickelodeon. I'm not trans, like, I'm 
you want to tuck your dick in between your legs and parade around in front of the mirror, like have at it. I don't care. I don't care what you do, but don't That's attack. Right. Don't don't force that on my kid, and I'm not going to force my sexuality on your kid. Like you know, maybe maybe you're into something else. Whatever. Yeah, I mean, I'm for freedom. <clears throat> look, period. I'm, but when it starts affecting the kids, and then the kids have to see it, and then I got to start explaining that to them, then it becomes my problem. Yeah, I mean. The whole transgender movement thing. I mean, it's it's all it is is focused on you know <clears throat> exposing children to sexualized material. Right. I mean, I mean, look, I, I don't have the answers, but it's like you know, if you're born that way, kids will figure it out on their own. Yep. And um, you know, unless the objective is to confuse and use them. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we've been. Now we're teaching, you know, children in this country that hard work's not necessary and and uh, that everyone is equal in every aspect, and that's just not the way this thing works. No, that's going to lead know? to a lot of fucking depression 20 years from now whenever they get yep. up the balls to go to Nashville and try to be a singer-songwriter and realize they're not good enough. I don't know one successful person that didn't work hard. I know some people that had that started off life on third base. I mean, I know some wealthy people that have got us, but anybody that's continued that success and has built that has had to work their ass off to get there. Mm -hmm. Do you know anybody successful that didn't work? Mm -mm. Nobody. I mean, some have more talent and some have better starts, but most every successful person I know has worked their ass off. The young people today just expect to have everything given to them. I mean, people who don't even want to work. I mean, something happened. There's a switch that happened in our world, and I guess it's the COVID deal where nobody wants to work no more. It's just crazy. I mean, we're talking, they wanted a $15 minimum wage jobs. Fucking, I think McDonald's is paying 18 to $22 an hour in places now. Can't and they get can't get people to, to freaking work. Shit, I'm thinking about getting a part-time there with my outside of my other three jobs. <laughs> I know, yeah. right? I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, you know, I've, I've got another business here in Nashville in the uh, construction business. And, you know, I'm looking at hiring the guys, you know, and starting out and paying 35 40 bucks an hour. And you can't find anybody to work that you can't, that you don't have to look over their shoulder every freaking minute. I mean, my dad was, he's still in the construction business. And he's like, you know, 10 years ago, you could pay somebody 35 bucks an hour and not even have to talk to right. them. Yeah. You know, they just was skilled, skilled labor and did their job. And, and now, man, I mean, <clears throat> if you, if you can find somebody that will work, you probably can't afford them. I mean, if you're a regular business, you know, that's the thing. It's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword in my mind because out here we have a hunting lodge. And back a long time ago when Jeff first started the business, there was a list of potential high school kids that wanted a job in the winter, cleaning birds, taking trashes out. They low, went to work at a hunting lodge. Low man on the totem pole type shit. And they do it in the evenings and on weekends. Now... You can't find anybody in high school that wants to do that shit. And then two, Jeff has realized that the person to fill that position is an older person who has done something in their past life, retired, looking for something else to do because they're reliable. They're dependable. You tell them to be here at five o'clock. They're here at four fifty. And so now what that has done is that's who Jeff's looking for to fill that position. So now he's not even going to look to high school kids. So high school kids are fuck going on out here now. Well, because, you know, I mean, look, look at our granddads. I mean, those were guys that was volunteering for war at 17 years old and lying about their age to go to war. And now we've got 17 year olds that need a safe room in high school in case their feelings get yeah. hurt. Yeah. I'm painting their fucking fingernails and wearing black shit. We was at that. We was at the, World War II Museum in New Orleans, and Andy said that. We went through in the picture, and it showed kids on Normandy, the beach. It just showed some just pictures, not like action, just pictures of the guys. They were grown fucking men at 19 years old then. These fucking pansy yeah. asses we got right now, fuck. I wouldn't even want them to fucking sack my groceries. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, here, here's here's another sad thing, man. I play a lot of military bases, and I'm I'm... You know, I love going out there and doing it. And something I always do 
beforehand is I'll reach out to the point of contact and just say, hey, I want to do whatever I can do when I'm out there, whether it's get up, do PT with the guys in the morning. I don't care what it is, like anything I can get away with, let's do it. And a couple of years ago, <clears throat> I was, we were playing at Fort Leonard Wood. It was one of the basic training uh, facilities the Army has. And so I think we got in at like 2 a.m. Uh, on base and I was up at 4 a.m. Uh, doing PT with the guys <laughs> and it was uh, the new recruits and of course the drill sergeants and so man I'm out on a run with these kids you know 18 19 years old I'm just thinking to myself like I was in ROTC for four years in high school and when we graduated we were ready I mean we were we were growing into the men like we were you know we could go to basic and be deployed these kids looked like they were 12 years yeah. old i mean going just like late puberty um and i brought it up to one of the guys and i said and he said we've actually had to create programs to run these new recruits through to build them up build their bone structure and their muscles up to handle basic training it's crazy it's the atrazine in the water that's what it is and that's that's you know here in you know a couple of years that's who's going to be fighting our battles for us i saw a video not long ago it was of a physical he was a trainer he was working out of college uh and i can't remember what college it was but there was a kid and he was doing like um he had a shirt off and he was doing like tricep extensions and the trainer he walked up with the camera and he said, you see these lines? And he's pointing to the kid's back because he didn't have a shirt on. And there were these horizontal lines from like where your ass kind of ass crack stops, uh, starts or whatever. And it went all the way up to about middle of his back and horizontal line, horizontal line, horizontal line. He said, this is the first generation of kids that we've seen that have stretch marks and horizontal lines on their backs and it, he said it's all because of the way when they were developing, they were all hunched over playing video games. And he said, now, obviously, this kid is a Division One athlete, and he had other interests outside of football. But he said this generation, these 18, 19-year-old kids that we're seeing now, is the first time that we've seen stretch marks in that pattern up their back. And he said it's all from when they were in that developmental stage, and they were all hunched over. So wow. think of that. Well, I mean, and I just sit here all the time and think about what's the answer for all this shit. I mean, you know, not a good one because I mean, just like I said earlier, like we don't even look to high school kids. Now we want to, we want an older age guy. That's going to be here. He's going to work his ass off. He's going to be here on time. He's going to do what we say. So like we, we did hire, a, we hired a kid. We had a, the guy that worked for me a long time, just <laughs> passed away. And we hired a young kid that's 19 years old, but he comes from a farm family. And he knew what he was getting into, and he's a hard worker. And I asked people about him, and they said nothing but great things about him. His family's hard working. He's a good kid. His interest is being out here in the hunting situation, and he should make us a great hand. Right. But to find him, everybody else that, that called me about a job, they're not all. I had a couple other guys, but it's just not. But when, if you find when, someone on Social Security, they're working. They the, money's not as important to them as as it is being away from getting away from the house. They want to make some money, but they're going to show up. They're not going to get a job in the oil field at sixty four years five years old. But they still got ten good years in them. A lot of them. But you even said when Harry passed away, I need to find another yes, guy of yes. that similar vein, yes. older, responsible, going to be here on time because they'll fucking work. They don't call in sick. They don't go get drunk the night before. They show up to work. They take pride in what they do. They don't have a real problem with being polite to someone. And they don't have a fucking chip on their shoulder. And they don't pick up a fucking phone all the time. The phone is the thing that wears me out all the time. That's our biggest problem in our country is get rid of them damn cell phones. And we can't do it. I'm the same way. I've got one right in front of me that I've had three or four messages doing this podcast I've had to reply to. But we all we all are built on that damn telephone. Yeah, somebody told me recently, actually last week, uh, that they're seeing a trend of kids uh, now getting flip phones. Oh, really? Like going back to flip phones and rejecting the smartphones. Maybe that's what it's going like to be. Like it's not, 
it's like it's not cool anymore, which is great if that's true. Yeah. I couldn't go back to a flip phone. No. I know. Everything, you know, people talk about the, the chip going in here or whatever, the mark of the beast. And I'm going, we already have that yes. because we can't leave the house without this thing. If we, if I drive downtown Nashville and left my phone at the house, I mean, it's hard to function. Yes. Everything's on it. Yes. <laughs> you know, we took a cab in uh, New York City and I, I had one, one of the, one cab driver. He did not use, he just knew the, the lay of the land. But another cab driver, like he put everything into his phone and like took us right to LaGuardia or whatever. I but, don't. I, I mean, think about the old school cab driver. Like, how the fuck are you gonna get around New York? How are you gonna get around Nashville? How do you think the old school parent was taking his family on vacation? Right. You know, we used to read the old fucking. I used to love an atlas. I'd buy an atlas every year, and I miss having an atlas because I don't always believe in the Google Maps and shit. But I, I think about that all the time. I thought, man, God, we've been all over the United States driving and doing different things. How the hell did we find a restaurant in New York City before we had navigation systems? Do we ask directions every 15 seconds to people to make sure we were going right? I mean, that but that's true. But the phone, I couldn't go to the flip phone because I couldn't text again. I couldn't oh, text no. when it was the old way of texting it. Shit, no. <laughs> Take me all day to send somebody a message, so no. <laughs> You'd figure it out. C is like three taps. I don't want to do that shit. I just want to... I do voice text if I had to do that stuff. You'll get so there. where do you play? You, you're playing in Oshkosh this week at the air show. Uh, we're just going up there. I've got a, a buddy of mine. We're, we're both pilots and uh, we're flying his plane up there. Uh, just hanging out a few days. And I think we're going to, we're going to play at the, the AOPA tent. He's actually a UPS pilot, part-time, part-time singer. To do he, it. We call him sky trucker. <laughs> So, uh, how he, uh, he flies his big 747s international. How long have you been a pilot? Uh, so I got my pilot's license before I graduated high school. Oh, shit. Yeah. So, so I actually was wanting to, um, had everything set up to, uh, enlist in the Air Force right after high school and just had, a different opportunity come up last minute and took it. Would you like to fly a P-51, an old World War II fighter plane? No, oh, that's my, that is my favorite plane. And yeah. Have you flown one before? You know somebody? <laughs> no. Wouldn't that be a badass though? Yeah, let's go. Hey, have you looked into anything with JFK and his plane crash, JFK Jr.? They, they no. said it was instrument, instrumental. Fit. Well, he's flying at night. But well, they said he wasn't. He wasn't licensed. Was to do he it not? In, he wasn't. In, you know, yeah, rated for IFR, and he flew into uh, the deep know, state haze or clouds or whatever. I mean, I can tell you, if you're not instrument rated, you fly into clouds and you can't see. You can easily get disoriented and and think up is actually you know you can feel like you're upside down when it, you're actually not i don't know i mean that's it's it's one of those things where i mean it sure as hell be easy to to fake that one. right but well, you're on this you're on the well, same page we are well why did he why did he fly at night if he wasn't i mean was he not expecting weather to roll in well i don't maybe because yeah, that's what happened because you can still fly you can fly at night and not be instrument rated right. as long as there's clear you know, cloud clearance. Yeah. You can see, uh, you know, for, for a mile out. In New York to Nantucket is probably only about a 30 minute flight or 45 minutes. It's not a long way. Cause I think that's what happened to Kobe's helicopter pilot. They got into fog and he got disoriented. He thought up was down, down was up. And he like basically just skidded them into the side of the mountain because he got, he got disoriented. Well, I don't think that was a conspiracy. I think that was that, an actual. No, I'm just up. saying that that's what happened. Yeah, I think the J. Yeah, I mean that whole thing is like is weird because whoever's flying that chopper, I mean, they had to be the best of the best. Figure. I mean, you know, and le- that's the, that's just it's weird. Unless it's he had like a medical emergency or something, maybe I don't know. But I think he was in contact with the tower the whole time. I think he was just thought he was smarter than what he was doing. Yeah, you could probably see a lot of that too. 
I think that's the case with that guy. The, and I also and I also heard that um, he had recommended them not taking the flight because of wind shear and uh, different conditions out there that was a little dicey. And you know, I, uh, again, that's what I that's what I read. But when you got somebody that's you know massive celebrity jumping on your ass and going, no, we're going to, you know, I want you to take off. This is what we're going to do. Instead of jumping in the car and driving to your, you know, wherever they were going to, it's like, actually, I tell you, you know, Caitlin, Caitlin Jenner is a no, pilot. I didn't know that. And yeah, and a really accomplished pilot actually. And so the, it, she, whatever had great advice for being a pilot and uh, said, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to be anywhere, you know? And if there's a, if there's, I don't care the smallest chance in the world that something could go wrong, you don't go. Yeah. You know, it's like you stay put and go fire my ass. I don't care. I'm assuming Caitlyn Jenner's running American Airlines because them fuckers find every way in the world they can to cancel a flight nowadays. So (laughs) I guess that's what, I guess Shim got her to other job. She's, you know what? I'm telling you right now, oh, oh, Caitlyn, Brucey, whoever the hell it is, it's, that's a hard person not to like. Very confusing. Yes. Because, but, but hey, look, like, again, you know, we're like, you do your thing and leave us alone. I mean, right. I can, you know, I can res- almost respect it enough to call her a she and be okay with it because, hey, like she's not trying to go out here and uh, warp children's minds. She's against all this shit that's going on. Yeah, she, her you and me know, are on the same page. Ninety nine percent of the things yeah. I think we're right with. Getting your pecker chopped off and wearing high heels. Not there. I don't think. I don't think Caitlyn did that though. She didn't get her I d- junk removed. I don't know. I don't know what all happened. But, but everything else that she stands for, she's a conservative. She, I mean, everything. I'm right there with her. So she's hard to. She, Shim, whatever the fuck very, it is, very difficult to. Yeah. Put, put my thumb down. Well, on you know, it. I mean, you, you know, people that actually do that, you'll never, never have like another orgasm. Yeah. Right. Ever. I mean, and like you're Ever. gonna, you're gonna get. Urinary tract infections and just regular <laughs> infections. Well, not even, not even, not even urinary tract because it's it's, it's inverted. A, uh, it's catheter. Well, it's it's inverted, and you gotta like what I've heard is you gotta have some kind of damn like uh, scotch or something that you gotta put up in that thing every now and then because it tries to grow back and heal itself. Yeah, yeah, it's like a major <laughs> issue, and like all the hair like gets pushed up in there. It is not pleasant. <laughs> And then uh, I've seen some of the well, being a psychopath. I've seen some of the post ops for women that go to men, and like that's just a catheter up there and a piece of your fucking thigh that they construct yeah. into a they th- dick. Like your forearm. Yeah, I just don't. What a fucked up people. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't. I don't understand being gay. First, I don't sure, care if Jeff? you're gay. Are you sure, Jeff? I'm positive. I don't care if you're gay. Okay. And I don't care what you do. You can't become a man, be a woman. But how in the hell could a man not want to have sex with a woman? I just, I don't get that. I, I just, and it's whole well, generations I, now, these young kids aren't having sex anymore. There ain't no, I've yeah. played video games with my kids when they're growing up and my grandkids, and I've never played a video game that made me think, ooh, this is better than sex. But you didn't grow up with it. Your brain had already developed. Right. Like kids that don't know any better that start out at my son's age, seven, eight, nine years old. Like that's just the way that they're brought up. Well, well you're getting you're getting those. Uh, it's uh, it, it like the same kind of endorphins you get yeah. from sex. Like I mean, it's like the dopamine going camera. out and yeah, the dopamine thing. And I mean, it's a it's a big problem uh, for sure. Testosterone levels are plummeting. I mean, they always have been through the generations, but you know, again, you know, that's why we're we got to have safe rooms in high schools and people's wearing dog collars to school and going in the wrong bathroom and teachers can't say anything to them. I mean, it's even happening in my hometown of Kingsport. I mean, uh, I've I've talked to several of my old teachers back there, and that's why they retired. They said we just can't. We can't take it. You know, they're standing there at a urinal when a chick walks in and 
uses the bat in the man's bathroom and they can't say anything to her, but that chick could go out there and tell somebody, Oh, you know, uh, this teacher, t- you know, touched me or something. And their ass is fired yeah. just for an accusation. And I was, you I know? was at a bar 30 years ago and a girl, I walked in a bathroom stall or bathroom and a girl was taking a leak on the urinal. She's drunk, good looking gal, had her old <laughs> mini skirt pulled up and she's sitting there on there taking a bit. Hey guys, bath girl's bathroom was full. Didn't think nothing of it. I thought it was kind of, you know, kind of funny. She's a pretty good looking gal. Didn't think much of it. But I couldn't imagine me going in a girl's bathroom and taking a leak and the girls come in there and it'd be legal. It'd be normal. They'd thrown my ass. They would have thrown me out. Yeah. I mean, I did it once accidentally. Well, I I've done walked that. Walked in there. And, well, I mean, I, I walked in there and, you know, there were people in the stalls and I looked around and I was like, man, this is <laughs> weird. There's no urinals in this bathroom. So I went into an empty stall and just, you know, start pissing like a big old racehorse. <laughs> and then I walked out and a couple of women's washing their hands. <laughs> so yeah, people, I, er, that's, that's a mistake. There's, that's a different type deal. Um, I had a buddy of mine in Red River, New Mexico was, we was a bunch of us were skiing there and he goes, where's the bathroom? Man? And as I pointed at, it, it was a girl's bathroom. Well, I thought the dumb bastard could read girls, you know, women's right there. He goes in and we're watching him. He's in there for five minutes. And then we see a bunch of girls go in there and we're laughing and they come out laughing and shit. About 10 minutes later, he comes out and he's like, fuck you motherfuckers. He said, I was taking a shit in there and they didn't have stalls on the <laughs> door. And he said, I sit there taking a shit and I was looking around and there's a tampon machine on the wall. And he's like, oh shit, this is a girl's bathroom. And those women came in and saw him. I said, what they do? He said, oh, they fucking laughed at me. He said, but I wasn't about to, I had to finish. But you know, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? But he did, he honestly did not know he was going in the girl's bathroom until he was already sitting mid squat. And there are times that the, the signs are a little like, you're like, what is this? What am I looking at? I can't think of what restaurant it is, but every time I go there, I'm like, okay. McGill's. No, uh, I, th- I think it's like Outback or some shit like that. No. Cause it's like blokes and some, something else. And I'm like, <laughs> What am I? You're I a bloke. I don't speak Aussie. Like, what? where do I go to here? So I kind of like, I, I do the urinal check. I just kind of peek in and if there's urinals, but there's another, there's another restaurant that's even more like vague. And I'm would like, you, would you be embarrassed to take Normally a- I just turn right. Have you seen the bar in New- in Miami? It's got the urinals and they got a bar top and you can be pissing and the bartender will give you a beer. It's the other side of the bar. Well, that's how it was a long time ago. Just an open bar. Well, there's places in New York. That Damn, it, I like there's that. There's places in New York that it was that. Well, I think it was for like chewing tobacco. It wasn't for urine. It was for chewing tobacco. Now this here is just you take a piss and the bar top's right there. You're sitting there and locking until you walk in the I bathroom. Like and piss. I wouldn't like that. No, I'm out on that. You a little embarrassed? So... To, I'm going to reel it back into your song. How did you, you said you didn't write it. How did you know that it was out there? Um, <clears throat> so when Barble, uh, dear friend, uh, great songwriter, y'all need to have him on here. You, you, you might not get much talking. You do a whole lot of laughing. Love to do it. And, we we uh, do that. One of the funniest guys I know, but so him and I, uh, we'll get together down at his farm and we'll ride around the old back roads and listen to songs. Either he's wrote or I've wrote. And he played me this one that he had just written. And I said, man, if you can't get somebody bigger to cut it, I want to, I want to cut it and I'll split the master with you. So, cause again, I mean, I've been feeling convicted for a long time. Well, three years really. Uh, and he's going, man, you know, this shit's wrong. What can I do? And it, it always feels like, you can't do anything like you have no power to stop it. Um, but again, they've used, <clears throat> they've used entertainment and music, the, you know, the libs for the left forever, uh, to influence people and in future generations. So country music has not and conservatives have not done that. So it's time to turn the tide. And so I just, I wanted to cut it and, uh, knew I was putting a little bit of a target on my back. And, but, uh, so when, and I just went in and, uh, him and I produced the track together and put it out a couple weeks later. Simple as that. What was, uh, so, did you see any blowback from, you know, have you had the, the phone call or anything like that? Anything weird happened since releasing this song? Uh, I've seen a few things, but I mean, honestly, I was expecting, uh, some blowback for sure. Um, 
99.9% of the reactions have been positive. You know, again, we're talking about country music fans, you know, Al Dean's not going out there and filling up a stadium with, you know, a bunch of trannies and gay cowboys, you know? Well, and I'm going to, you so, know, so I'm going to say that your song is better than Al Dean's because of the simple fact that you haven't had the music video to catapult you. Yours got to number five, just based off of the message and your delivery and the song itself. Whereas, you know, you saw Aldine's explode after the video came out. Yeah. His actually came out, um, that song a week before I released, I'm just saying, and then, you know, it's been about a month and a half now. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that all that happened at the same time, you know, uh, and I put, I, I still have zero money in p- promotion behind this song. So that's another thing. I mean, we're, we're talking about all those guys. I mean, in the top 100 have huge record deals and hundreds of thousands of dollars behind them in promotion and, and all that. And we put zero in it. So the fact that it made it that far is all just, Bright Breitbart is was really the sole reason I think it blew up, and they were excited to see it go up the charts, and just kept on, you know, doing articles over those next few days, and and then people started reaching out like Newsmax, and you know, a week before I was trying to figure out how to get in contact with them, and and then you know they were calling me, so that was pretty cool. I mean, and it's a. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's a flash in the pan or, or what, but it definitely, you know, for where I'm at, uh, laid, laid some groundwork for a, uh, some more stuff here. So it'll be interesting to, to see what it turns into. Now, let me ask you about this, about country music, where it's at today. Because if you listen to country music today, it has nothing similar to country music that was 20 years ago, 40 years ago, or the stuff that my grandfather grew up with. Now, a lot of that stuff was horse shit back then. But... George Strait is. He's yeah, still, he throw I, back to I, old I, Texas I'm thinking, swing. I'm thinking further back than that, like some of the early music. Anyway, country music today doesn't resemble that at all anymore. What, <clears throat> I mean, are, are, are these people trying to appeal to a younger demographic, or is it just the natural shift of things? Well, you know, we're talking about, I think it's a, it's a natural shift in a way because, you know, younger generations, they have different experiences and, uh, different musical influences. I mean, you know, it's, you're never going to have, well, you're always going to have, you know, good old traditional country music, but also there's so, there's so much hip hop and, rock and country music at this point is 10 different genres you know country music doesn't need country music doesn't mean anything when you say country music i mean you have to have a more definitive title to each genre of country music so it's it's and that's the reason it's the biggest genre is because i think there's so much variety uh so you just have to do what you do and uh, don't worry about the rest. The worst thing you could do is try to conform and, and chase something. You'll never, you'll never catch it and you'll never achieve anything doing it that way. I did it for a long time. And that's what you do when you're a young artist, you, you're, uh, you know, imitating in a sense until you figure out who the hell you are. You know, I'm, I, I was so much an Alan Jackson fan and a George Strait fan. I got to a point where I'd go in the studio early on and when I first started doing records and they would, they had to beat the Alan Jackson <laughs> out of me because I, I sounded just yeah. like him, you know? And it's like, Hey, we've already got an Alan Jackson. We need to figure out what you do. Just, just do what you do and uh, stop st- trying to sound country because you're already <laughs> country enough we might even have to dial that down but 
So how do you do that? So, like, yeah, I, mean, I mean, like if they say just do what you do, like what if you are just Alan Jackson 2.0? It's like I can't fucking stop that. Or did they know that you were kind of putting on a, a facade or a front? Well, a good producer knows uh, <clears throat> you can hear it. I mean, now that I'm producing guys, I mean, you can you can hear when something's authentic right. uh, to who you are. And a good example of what you just said, I think Easton Corbin, when he first came out, everyone said he sounded like George Strait, which he did. All that, um, what was that stuff? Uh, I'm a little more country than that. When that came out, I mean, I thought it was George Strait. Everybody thought it was George Strait. And uh, what I hear is, <clears throat> a few records out, he completely changed what he did because he didn't want to be sound like George Strait. But I'm going, shit, you've already had like three or four number ones. I don't think there's a problem with it at this point. That's just how you sound. Um, so that's a different, that's a different deal. But uh, it takes years and years and years. And as far as country music, I think to to go through the shit and fall on your face and get to the, get the give a shit beat out mm -hmm. of you. And then that's when you start doing your thing. It's for me, that's when it started, you know, uh, you've got to live it a little bit. And if you don't, I think you're, you're a flash in the pan and you may be hot for a second and then, then you're gone. But if you uh, put in the time and, you got a little bit of life experience. Think about 40 years ago, okay? Even Alan Jackson, uh, the Don Williams, Haggard, Cash. These guys were damn near in their 40s before they were ever heard of. I mean, they were men, and that's when they started their careers, you know? Right. And so, you know, Waylon and Willie, I mean, they could hardly get arrested before <laughs> – they turned outlaws and they were in the, in the scene for a long, long time. Uh, so I, that's, that's the country music I, I know and love. And, uh, nowadays it's like, Oh, well, you know, you're 30 years old, you're aging out. <laughs> How about, let me ask you this. What's your opinions on uh, Miranda? Lam I like Miranda Lambert before we get in here. I think, I think she is better than any of the old time lady singers. I like Miranda Lambert, but, I like Miranda. I, I think yeah. what she did at her concert, from what I've read and what I haven't seen it, she called out some ladies for taking a selfie with her on stage. I thought that was a bad move on Miranda's part. Those people paid big money to be up there, and they were thrilled to be around her, and I think she kind of spit in the face of her fans. Yeah, I haven't really read a lot about that. I mean, what did she say exactly? She stopped the concert and basically called them ladies out for, excuse me, ma'am, I'm trying to sing up here. Don't let me interrupt y'all's fun. And they were just wanting selfies with her on stage singing while she was performing. And they I just were, They were sitting like front row or something? Yeah, and I just I thought it was kind of rude. There ain't nobody watching them ladies down there. They're watching they, Miranda. They probably paid a shit ton of yes. money, too. The, one lady said she felt like she was chastised back in elementary school by her teacher, and she's a 45-year-old woman. Very embarrassing. I just, but, but I, don't, I don't know why you do yeah, that. Yeah. But isn't some of that making its way in entertainment where like you check your phone in before the, before the concert or the comedy act starts? I think it's comedians that do that. Maybe. I don't know. But I mean, but I know there are some comedians that, especially like comedians that are like working on shit. Yeah. But like, I don't want this out because it's not a finished product yet. Right. So we're going to put your phone in a lockbox. If you, if it's an emergency, you can take it out and they'll open it. But went to a, a, a comedian place in Nashville and they made you do that over. Uh, and I can't remember where the hell it was at, but it was in Nashville that we, that, what is it? Name of it? Zanus. Yes. They made you lock up your phones there. Yeah. But, but Miranda Lambert, what was Miranda should have done is, is, is she should have saw that happen and bit down there and got the selfie. Yes. Right? I mean, wouldn't you figure, I mean, you know, that's, I mean, that's the world we live in and you know, they're out there just being star shit. I thought, I thought that's, that's, I thought so too. It's kind of, that's forgiving. It's kind of like the concert. Billy Joel did it. And so did the Foo Fighters, I think. Is that Dave Grohl, the Foo Fighters? Mm -hmm. And they let that kid come up that did the yeah. Metallica riff on the fucking uh, guitar. Have you seen that video? Oh, that yeah. kid's badass. Yeah. That right there makes everybody feel good in the whole thing. You showing a little bit of, you know, you connect into your fans. But what what does absolutely what doesn't make sense is 
and I've I'm kind of like you. I've not I've I've seen snippets of it, but I hadn't seen the whole thing. She is like she is a uh, she's an established artist, like big time. What would she have to gain in her mind of doing that? Being a bitch. Yeah, but I mean I that's know. all there can be. There's nothing for her to gain but by th- that. There's no positive outcome of this. Like no. you said, if she bends down and like takes a <laughs> selfie with these people. Makes their day, and everybody loves it. Well, and then that might go viral, and like more people are buying Miranda Lambert tickets. Now it's like, I'm not going to go. Why would I pay $500 a seat to go sit up for, uh, front row just to be fucking scolded? Well, she'll sell out because she's big anyway. She will, probably. But. It's kind of like T-Swift. She's going to sell out regardless. So you're, you're, you're a Nashville guy. I'm going to ask you a question about a restaurant there. Uh, or not a restaurant. I think that's using the word restaurant kind of loose. Hattie B's Chicken, have you had it? Yeah. Have you had the, I would say. the the mother clucking hot one? No, I can't do it. Well, we've tried it, and it's impossible to do. I don't know how anybody can eat that shit. I can't do it, but I love Hattie B's. But uh, I've always said the best best fried chicken is Nashville's at Publix. I've, I've heard that from <laughs> I've heard that somebody else said that too. What about the what's the restaurant we went to in Nashville? The high end place we went to. Do you remember the I name don't of remember. it? Uh-uh. It was very 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 good. And I wish I could think of the name. It was a steakhouse we went to, but it was the food was very good. Do you go to Knoxville? Some correct? Knoxville. Yes. You ever yeah, you ever yeah. eat at Ch- Chesapeake's there? That's yep. I used to play. So that same corporation owns uh, Calhoun's and a place called Smoky Mountain Brewery. And so Calhoun's and the brewery is where I used to play all the time back in the day. Well, Chesapeake's has got some good food right there by the convention center. Chesapeake's? Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's the one that we went to. Okay, I'm going to ask you a tough question before we get out of here. Uh-oh. Rank the top three greatest country singers of all time see that's fucking impossible no it's do. not on his opinion on it it's impossible <laughs> one don williams oh i like don yep uh don williams um two See, you put people on the spot and they're not this finished. is just my this is my this is I'm just gonna lay okay. it out there. I mean, this is just mine. So Don Williams, um Johnny Cash, and Marty Stewart. Wow, oh. Marty Stewart, no hat. Didn't didn't yeah. see that. And Johnny Cash is a weird is a is a weird example because like he got to where he was just talking in his song, especially later in his career. Well, John, the thing with country music. And this is another thing that, you know, the guys instilled in me is as far as being a singer, singer, doing everything correct, Cash was, if you, if you want to rate him on that, he was one of the worst, but here's, here's where country music, um, is different than everything else. You could be the best singer on the planet. And not sell a record because nobody believed it. So Cash, when he sang something, by God, you believed Very it. True. Willie Nelson, terrible so, singer. You know, yeah, Willie's not a good singer. No, no, I mean, I, <laughs> not even close. I mean, <laughs> Conway Twi- Conway Twitty was a great singer from back in the day. Oh yeah, uh, you know, I mean, there was. There's a lot of great ones. That's just my personal, personal favorites. I mean, Marty Stewart, um, he was the reason I moved to town. Uh, actually, I, uh, I was, like I said, in ROTC and in high school and, uh, with the high and tide about a straight lace looking as they come. And I had <clears throat> played in bluegrass bands in East Tennessee and just started randomly writing some songs and went in and did a couple of demos there in Kingsport and a buddy I played in a band with, he said, I got us uh, tickets to go see Marty Stewart at the Carter fold, which is June Carter's home place in Hilton, Virginia. And he said, we're going to go up there and, and uh, I want you to give your CD of those songs to Marty. So we end up going up and we waited till we were last in line and I go up to Marty and hand him that CD with my, 
number written on it in Sharpie. And I said, man, I appreciate it if you give us a lesson. And he said, well, you need to talk to this guy over here, the, his bass player, which was Paul Martin. And he used to be the lead singer of Exile. And uh, Paul said, well, the CD player's broke on the bus. Uh, so just trying to get me to get the hell out of there. And, and my buddy Charlie said, well, I've got my guitar in a truck. Can he play them for you? <laughs> and so... He said, sure. So I ran out there in the truck, got Charlie's guitar, and came back and played some songs. And two weeks later, I was in Nashville writing with him. Jeez. And that was my first semester of my senior year. And that's when I started, you know, I started commuting back and forth to Nashville, writing. And I was like, well, shit, what am I going to regret more? Like, never knowing where this goes or, you know, joining the Air Force. And so I just, I made a decision you know, if it doesn't work out in three years, then the Air Force will be there. So here I am, you know, still still trying to figure this shit out. <laughs> so what was it that kept you? Or like, did you see some glimmer of hope after, like you said, okay, I'm going to give myself three years. Did you start to see an upward trajectory that you're like, okay, well, maybe I can do this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, after two years, I signed my first publishing deal and record deal, and that lasted about five years. Um, and then another publishing deal, and uh, I was touring a lot then too. So, I mean, there was there was enough traction for me to keep going. Right. And again, it's it's something that it turned into something you know that I before I wanted to do, and then. Then I felt like I had to, right. kind of like an addiction. I mean, once you get a taste of it, uh, you just want to keep doing it, you know. Yeah. So, I'm, and I love, <clears throat> I love, you know, being on stage and telling a story, and uh, really have, have fell in love with every aspect of the of the business besides, you know, the this bullshit uh, political stuff we're having to deal with now and people getting canceled. That's a whole whole new thing, but. You're navigating. So yeah, man. I mean, that's all you can do is trying to. So what's next? Le- leaning in. To, what's next for you? Uh, well, I'm going out on a tour um, this fall, just an acoustic tour, about 40 dates. Going to be putting those up uh, pretty soon, September, October, uh, and into the earlier part of November. So, <clears throat> you know, that's that's. I haven't been on the road like that, and really about two years since 2020 and um, looking forward to that. And then just going in the studio, I'm going to be releasing a song about every month and uh, don't have any big plans, just rolling with the momentum and oh, you can do. putting out good music, man. You know, do you like the acoustic? Do you like it? Do you, do you, is that more uh, appealing to you than like the full band type stuff? Mm, I mean, I love playing with a full band, um, but you know, if if you can't go out there and sell it with one voice and one guitar, you ain't you don't need to be doing right. it. And um, that's it's you know, it's it's way more uh, personal and and cool to go out there and do it. This is just more of like uh, jumping back in the ring kind of thing and getting out there and uh getting my road legs under me again and, and all that so you know we'll see we'll see where it leads and if it's a success then uh shit i think i think al dean needs to call me to to come open for him is what there i need go. that, is, that'd be, is what, need, what needs to happen that'd be a cool deal maybe <laughs> yeah. i do a collab that'd be a good gig we went and i saw uh kenny chesney last year and that dan and shay opened for them oh it was absolutely terrible so you would be a lot better fit have you ever played with it's Ches- that bro country? Oh, that's terrible. I love Kenny Chesney, but I'm not a fan of Dan and Chase. Have you met Chesney ever? I have not. I have, not. I have a feeling I'd be he's disappointed. East, he's East Tennessee boy. I knew that. I'm have a feeling I'd be awful disappointed. I have, think he probably votes. He probably runs a little liberal on me. Because I uh, a couple years ago we went and saw Aaron Lewis acoustic, and it was hands down like it was almost a spiritual experience the way that he was able to command that stage was just him, a guitar. And I think he had, he had one other person up there, but I don't have any desire to go see a stained concert at all. 
But like, right. if you told me, hey, I've got two tickets to go see Aaron Lewis acoustic, I'd fucking I'd be there tomorrow. Who's but, it? Yeah. But stained and the pyros and all that other stuff, I have zero interest to go see that. Give him a guitar and play the same songs, just him and a bar stool. I'm right there with you. My wife is a big Brett Eldridge fan. I think's his name. And we were supposed to go do a he does a Christmas acoustic deal, and we were busy. And I, she bought tickets, and we didn't get to go. And that's her dream is to go see this guy. So I've got to go see it. And I think he does an acoustic set. I loved it. See, I. Country guys acoustic I want to see, but I don't want to see fucking Poison do as an acoustic or Van Halen or shit. Fuck that. I want to see him rip some guitars yeah. and jump around. Not nowadays because Axel. <laughs> Somebody Axel, Axel looks her- terrible now. Did you see Axel sing to Lisa at Lisa Marie's funeral? I didn't. Oh, no. don't. It's bad. It's embarrassing because he guy. they were so good. Guns and Roses back in the day. They need heroin and whores. That's a problem. They run out of heroin and whores, and they're terrible now. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that's that's part of the deal. The rock stars, man. Mm. I guess so. When they start settling down. It's just not the same. No. I mean, just think about all that music they made back then and how many drugs and everything else was running through that, their systems. I mean, it's crazy. And you think about and you hear about them being broke. You know, how the hell can you make that kind of money and be broke? And you see it all the time. Yeah, it just yeah. blows my mind. I like. Well, did you see that interview with Steven Tyler one time? They were oh. like, you know, um, you, you know, he was like, you know, talking about being broke, and they, and they said, where did it all go? He said, up my nose. Yeah. He's I honest was, about it. I was just going to bring up Steven Tyler. <laughs> Listening to him talk about some of those writing sessions that they had, and like you said, he's just like, it just went up my nose. But it's crazy because he was like. We would just lock ourselves in an apartment, a little two-bedroom shack, and we're going to stay in here until we either have an album or we kill each other. And they, I think that's the way an Leonard album. Skinner did it, too. Really? Yep. They go out in the middle of the woods. They had them a studio in the middle of the woods, and they'd rip. And... I can't imagine the amount of drugs and alcohol that they went through on these writing sessions. You imagine the smell. <sighs> Lord. So how does it work? My last question, and we'll let you go. Um Writing and co-writing. So, like, is there a a certain amount that you have to write to be considered a co-writer, or could you just do like one phrase or whatever? Oh, you could just be sitting there in the room and not say anything. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, if I wrote a song with you in the room, you'd be a co-writer. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. I got a song. Yep. So, is, so is that like? Sorry, I'm giving a little. The, the uh, some people may not like me spreading the uh, inside <laughs> information, <laughs> but but because if you're not a writer, and and that's that's the thing, it's like that's that's what's messed up is you know all these guys want to be writers on the on a song, and you go in there and uh, they sit around and they don't con- contribute to the tune, but hey, they get a third or they get a half. Of the publishing. I did not know so. that. I would figure you had to at least contribute like a line or two. Nope. Wow. So, so is there a way that people are like kind of fudging the numbers a little bit? Like, oh no, I, I'm a, I'm a co-writer on that. When in reality, like maybe the writer just did him a solid and was like, yeah, you can sit in while we do this. Well, here's the thing. It's hard to get anything cut if you're not writing with the artist anymore. Oh. So... So you go, well, I'm going to give, you know, I know they're not going to do shit, but I'm going to get my song cut. Right. Right. What's crazy is when people give away songs like Mark Chestnut wrote friends in low places, I think. And then Garth Brooks cut it and made millions for both of them. I'm sure I'm assuming. Well, that. actually it was, um, uh, it was, uh, Earl Bud Lee Mark, that wrote that Mark song. Chestnut did not write it. He, he, did he have it out first then? He, he probably had it out first, yeah. So Earl Bud Lee wrote that song. And originally, I forgot how the story goes, uh, but he sold that song. He, he tr- like, gave the rights, put the rights, gave the rest of this song over to uh, um, the guy that owned this bar in Nashville because his bar tab was so high. <laughs> he owed, like, two, two grand. And so he just gave him the this song and uh I, th- I think later on it was they they figured out how to get it back or something but uh he basically sold the rights for a bar tab and, and that, i think that's 
correct me if I'm wrong, but it's still the the top selling country song of all time. I would say it would be pretty damn close. What about? I did not know that. Yeah, old time song out of the way, but uh, "Gentle on My Mind." Glenn Campbell had a hit with, and it was covered by mm-hmm. hundreds of artists back then. And I, Dean Dillon might have wrote "Gentle on My Mind." I don't know. It's a long time ago. Have you ever played that song? Yeah, I used to play a lot of Glenn Campbell songs. And you played "Gentle like- on My Mind." Yeah. How the hell do you remember the words that son of a bitch? That's a fucking story by itself. Oh, I know it. I mean, you just you just do. I mean, I mean, shit. I'll I'll forget the lyrics to my own song sometimes, but if you're playing that shit all the time, you just it's just ingrained in there, you know. Glenn Campbell's one of the greatest country singers ever, I think. And guitar players. Oh. He was, you know, part of the Rat Pack in L.A which is people don't know. That is a very good story. Did you watch the story on Netflix on that? I did. That is a great, great, great story. He was just a jingle writer and player, basically, and played, filled in on music. And he was the guy that also funded, um, you know, Alan Jackson wrote for his publishing company, and he he gave Alan uh, $2,000 to go in and cut his first four songs with Keith Stegall and those first four songs was uh um here in the real world chasing that neon rainbow blue blooded woman and Dallas boy J- Alan Jackson was a classic Whew. I did not know that yep badass stuff um all right my man we're gonna let you go we've gone a while now been a very interesting <laughs> podcast we really appreciate it yeah good luck to you out there hey, and keep doing what you're doing Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you, and good luck and continued success. God bless you, and appreciate you standing up for Real America. Appreciate it, guys. That's uh, need need guys like you to support dudes like us. It's tired of it and putting it on the line. So keep doing what you do. We do appreciate it very much. Thank you, sir. You have a great right. day. Talk to All y'all right, soon. See you, Austin Moody. Great guy. Very interesting stuff. Learned a lot here. Country music historian. Almost. A lot of stories there. I did. That's a pretty interesting deal about friends in low places. I knew Mark Chestnut had cut it first. I thought he wrote it. I thought, boy, you gave that one away. But that was when Garth's heyday, too. Back when Garth was still Garth and a man. <laughs> I'm going to be worried about him coming whooping my ass. He used to be he a might, bar bouncer he in, might do it. in Stillwater. He might do it, Jefferson. What else we got? That's basically it. Let's uh Lucky Duck's got brand new uh I saw it they got flappers. So here's the deal. Whenever you've got spinners out there and you're goose hunting, there's always like you gotta like get the cadence right to where when you press the off button, the white side is down. It's just something us goose hunters, it's a nervous tick that we have. If the white side's up, we always think that the birds are going to flare. Forget that we've got, you know, 10 dozen snow silhouettes or <laughs> silhouettes. So in they've the made background. it easy. Turn it off, the white side automatically goes down. It's pretty interesting. So I did see that on their Instagram uh, today. So if you're a goose hunter and you got that nervous tick, don't worry about it. They will be at Delta at Little Rock. Yep. Come, come by and say hi. Say hi to Luke and them at, at uh, Lucky Duck. Come by and say hi to me at Boss. Me and Dirk will be there. And I'll be at Squad Fest. So if you're there, come say hello. And I guess Jesse's wearing a bikini now? Might If it's that hot, I don't yeah. know. There is that splash pad. <laughs> if your wife's wearing a bikini jumping around on the splash pad, Dan Reese is on his way from Wisconsin <laughs> right now. Really? All right. Thank y'all for listening to us. God bless y'all. Have a great week. Got a really cool podcast coming up at the end of the week. We've got the number one rated high school football player defensive football player in the United States will be on with us. He's going to Ohio State. We will talk with him and talk about the recruiting process, going to Ohio State, and being a big-time football player at the How state of Texas. How much money he's about to get. Oh. Whew. Little bastard's going to mm. out-earn all of us. I wonder if I claim a little bastard. He might whoop your ass. Ah, he's on Zoom. Oh, he's he's going to be on Skype with us. We won't be in the office today. Anyways, can't wait to hear that. Look forward to it. Thank you all very much. God bless you all. Have a great day. Go check out our sponsors, but first, go check out Austin Moody's work. Uh, you know, help him out wherever you can. Stream his song; it'll help him. Uh, check out Dirty Duck Coffee, Ducks Unlimited, Mossberg, Double T British Kennel, Stanfield Outfitters, Hemp Hill Farms. Get that CBD. Alpha Outdoor Specialties, uh, Looking Glass Podcast, Shin Gear, Dive Bomb Industries, Pacific Calls, and Boss Shot Shells. 